Hi. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs>
I might be kind of hungry in just a week, so.
everybody for being here. So, um, so this round table, as it suggests, is really about discussing what the hell post-critical IR means, which everybody's been asking me. Uh, we have a few strong advocates in the room and a lot more other skeptical people around, uh, including myself, perhaps. Um, so we're going to structure this quite simply. Uh, I'm going to do an introduction of 10 or so minutes based on a paper that was circulated which discussed this question. Uh, based on an earlier workshop and contributions from uh, everybody here and some other people who aren't here, uh, which draws together some of the themes that we're talking about, uh, and try and expand this later in the discussion. We'll go through everybody here who will talk about, I think we said we're going to talk about uh, the biggest problem with critique and I at the moment, and then what might be alternative going forward that fits into this theme, so that people can talk about whatever they want. Uh, I'll say, and hopefully we can connect this to some of the other panels. We had one earlier, more on philosophical discussions of what it means to uh, what critique, the state of critique today, um, uh, and essentially try and draw this together. Um, but as I said, I'll start by introducing this now, uh, quite briefly, hopefully, and quite generally. And I want to speak to the name first, the, the label itself, uh, that has, again has received some mixed reactions. Uh, and, of course, the first question is, is a label like this ever necessary per se? Uh, and, of course, a label like this will never reflect the kind of diversity of the work going on in the field, and it's not meant to. Um, as any label, this is an abstraction. And to begin, I want to say that abstractions like this, as Isabel Spengers has put it, are intended to capture a certain moment, to act, as she puts it, as lures, luring attention towards something that matters by vectorizing concrete experience. Uh, any effort to construct an abstraction capturing emerging orientations within an intellectual field like this is thus always going to be tentative and partial. It's only an answer to a challenging situation which produces a certain necessity and its meaning. So the particular name per se, whatever it is, is not necessarily relevant, although I hope there is a certain logic to it. Uh, what matters is what it points to, and that's what I want to try and introduce today, what specifically it points to. Uh, and this, again, is my own understanding, drawing hopefully on some of the things people are going to say afterwards uh, to open up discussion. And from my perspective, at least, um, I want to stress how, at its most crude, but also perhaps most foundational level, this idea of a post-critical IR is substantively about the future and not the present. Um, in this regard, it's about fundamentally reconsidering the social scientific relationship uh, to political crisis. Uh, we know, of course, everybody here today, that crisis is supposed to be everywhere uh, in one form or another and being talked about across the conference this morning, everywhere in the debates, there are sentiments of crisis everywhere. And such a critical uh, obsession with crisis is, in fact, quite normal. As uh, Etienne Balibar once put it, uh, sorry, that's wrong, as Etienne Balibar once put it, any crisis renders the contradictions of the social world visible and in so doing brings to, fore, bring to the, brings to the fore the internal structure of the world, particularly the political world, the social world, that is to be the object of critique. And that's quite normal. We look at what's going on in the world and critique, uh, crisis uh, provokes critique. Balibar continues by noting, however, that the regularity with which critique uh, self-questions at moments of crisis should put us on our guard. Because in a certain way, this correlation works too well, but how to elude it? And ultimately, I want to say the difficulty with this crisis critique correlation relates to its retrospective approach. Critique, critique is engaged in praxis, for the most part, in reaction to an extant state of affairs. As uh, Ernst Bloch, I can't pronounce that, wrote, this retrospectivism sees critique focus the majority of its efforts on dissecting a closed world <coughs> that has already become seeking essentially a reversal of what is perceived to negatively characterize the world at the moment. And at its extreme, this retrospectivism uh, results in uh, any future of the genuine, processively open kind being sealed off and alien to contemplation. This retrospective tendency then provokes the erasure of the possibility of imagining our roles in creating different world political futures. 
pondering instead only a kind of semi-nihilistic hope that we can uh, resist, go forward, attempt to do what we can do, but ultimately believe that change is extremely unlikely. Um, <clears throat> however, to continue with Bloch, what post-critical in my sense means is essentially that only thinking directed towards changing the world and informing the desire to change it uh, does not confront the future as embarrassment and the past as spell. Only knowledge as conscious, conscious theory practice confronts becoming and what can be decided within it. This connection is much more than just about engaging the world, about doing something. It's about connecting to the future. It's about connecting deep concretely to the future. The ultimate stake of thinking post-critically is then to stay with this stubbornly future-oriented focus. It means to be adamantly anti-presentist, to be against the present. And it, at its most extreme form, to some degree, and this would be somewhat controversial, it means to ignore the present, to ignore the present crisis, or rather to take it only as a symptom, not a disease. It means to take what we are discussing generally, Trump, climate change, etc., as symptoms rather than the core of the disease itself. It doesn't mean to ignore them per se, its most extreme form, but it means that we need to do something other than merely react to the excellent state of affairs. We need to stop having a reactionary form of critique. So in this end, post-critical IR is not asking what comes after critique, i.e. what might mark the end of critical IR. It's asking what we what needs now to come with critique for it to be more effective in its daily practice and theoretical relevance. And I use the term post here then very much in a post-colonial sense, not to mean we're after colonialism or we're after structural oppression, but to mean that we've reached a situation in which something must be added to critique and that this requires sustained theoretical, methodological and practical attention. This refers then to a chronological, this does not refer then to a chronological period, i.e. after critique, or to a persistent historical condition in which critique needs to renew itself. Um, <clears throat> the ultimate effort then, to end with Deleuze a little more dramatically, the ultimate effort of post-critical IR in relation to crisis, in relation to the present, is, uh, is this, the, the fact that there is no need to hope or fear at the moment. The only goal for an engaged critical theory is to look for new weapons that can target the future as an underdetermined space of possibility. And with that in mind, then, I'm going to run through very quickly what that means concretely from my perspective in the paper in terms of the other papers that have been written. How do we get towards a future-oriented critical IR? What makes up that approach? First, it's about looking very concretely at the lineages of critique, and specifically the theoretical lineages of critique. Uh, why? Well, first, and paradoxically, because as we all know, critique has been co-opted to some degree. The Israeli military uses the, the Israeli military uses Foucault. The Israeli military uses Gramsci. The New Right uses Gramsci. The New Right uses uh, Deleuze. The New Right uses Foucault. BuzzFeed uses Deleuze, Jameson, etc. So critique has been co-opted in this sense, and this has been discussed quite a lot. Um, <clears throat> as in fact, as uh, Jean-François Jolet and Michael C. Williams have written, perhaps the most contemporary appropriation of many critical ideas is found neither in the liberal universities of the Atlantic world nor in the progressive movements of the political left. It lies instead in today's radical conservatism. And the question here is to ask how this has occurred. And to repeat myself, this is question is not about dwelling on the relation between critical theory uh, and these co-options or blaming critical theory in any way. I'm not really concerned with that debate about if critical theory causes this. What's interesting to me here is only the contrast. The contrast that lies in the example provided by these enemies, if you want to call them that, of critique, um, and ourselves. The fact that they have achieved a comparative capacity to actualize critical ideas uh, in praxis relative to our own failure to do so, relative to our own complacency to the state of affairs. How has the new right mobilized Gramsci or Deleuze to create their own system and create that as a foil on which to understand how we have not, and to return to the theoretical lineages of critique to see where the problem has emerged, where we are stuck. What is the sticking point for moving critique beyond pure theoretical reflection at a certain level and particularly retrospective theoretical reflection? Um, and to stress this, I think we can, I want to turn back to our contemporary response to the, uh, the crisis we see today. There's a lot of talk of, the resi of resistance at the conference here, of becoming an activist, of saying what's wrong, of saying what we must oppose. Um, from my perspective, this uh, is somewhat opposed to the post-critical idea. Um, the response, in fact, is somewhat inadequate. Uh, 
to go with uh, Nick Schoenig and Alex Williams, resistance always means resistance against another force. Uh, it is a defensive and a reactive gesture rather than an active movement. We do not resist a new world into being, sorry, that's not the quote, uh, we resist in the name of an old world. Resistance to some degree is always about the present. It's about resisting what's occurred, and it has immense value because of that, but it does not create a new future in and of itself. And I'll come back to that. And again, this is demonstrated by who those forces who have co-opted critique. They have not resisted against the present order. They've stepped outside it and created a different future. They are unconcerned with resistance, and we, to some degree, should move beyond resistance also. Um, <clears throat> so the first post-critical state, I'm not going to go into detail here because I think Zhao will talk about it a little bit, other people will too, lies in understanding how we have gotten to a blocked state vis-a-vis -vis the theoretical uh, coordinates of certain critical perspectives in IR, how they cannot move towards an open, underdetermined future, how despite the fact that they're about contingency, they're about imminency, that they look backwards, <coughs> they look at what's become rather than what could become to some degree. So the first stake in post critical IR then go, is about going theoretical and understanding where we've gone. Not wrong, but where we need to go per se. The second point, which I'll move through quickly, uh, is essentially about uh, post-critical IR, is about the critique of critique in the very social theoretical sense, here mainly within STS, Science and Technology Studies, Anne-Marie Moll, Bruno Latour, uh, Michel Serre, uh, Zorzani, all these people, uh, who are essentially concerned with the hermeneutic styles of critique, the way in which critique is done very concretely, and criticizing the way it's done. Um, this is probably the, the greatest focus, the way in which critique itself is done. Uh, and I'll just focus on one, they're probably their strongest criticism relates to the judgmental reasoning that's at the center of critique, the fact that critique judges, that it stands there as a kind of external arbiter, even when it provokes a form of hermeneutic internalism, which attempts to judge the political world from the outside based on a certain ethical preoccupations. And of course, critique always necessitates judgment. Every critical object, uh, project begins with an object whose existence or effects we want to problematize. The difficulty, however, is this judgmental form of reason that emerges that then attempts to associate blame, per se, or to denounce certain individuals, structures, or people. This judgmental reasoning is problematical, according to Michel Serre, because it's essentially an extremely weak form of thought. It's so sure of itself. And again, this isn't to say it, should be, it shouldn't be used, but it should be complemented by other practices of thought. This is the key post-critical move within social theory, that we need other practices of thought other than being critical in terms of denunciation, in terms of thinking judgmentally. We need to find new styles through which to do critique. And we can do this very simply by recognizing that judgmental reason is itself only a rhetorical style. It has no particular political ends to which it's pointed. It has no particular political point. It's an empty signifier per se. It's simply a style of reasoning. Uh, and with uh, Ian Hacking, there's no essence to the social scientific or even natural scientific valorization of any particular style uh, of thinking. And if we ask why one persists, whether we're talking about judgmental reasoning or any other form, the answer is more likely to be ecological rather than logical. We do not use particular styles because we have a good reason to use them. They're simply what we use. We've gotten used to using this style of reasoning in one way or another. But as the ecology of critique itself has shifted, i.e. its context, its situation, the world around us, we require to shift these styles of reasoning. We require to move beyond putting critique in the position of, uh, with Latour being the detective looking around for the problems uh, that occur. With Rita Felsky, we need to move away from the hermeneutics of suspicion. And people are already doing this, uh, and that's important. Uh, and some of the panel panelists here, I think, will talk about this. Uh, they're essentially about writing differently, about um, engaging differently, uh, engaging with different audiences. My favorite example here is Marx. You know, Everyone Marx is an ideal social scientist. Das Kapital, perfect. A beautiful social science down to the... the he didn't only write that. If he wanted to do something different, he wrote the Communist Manifesto with Engels. He wrote in incredibly different styles at different points in time. <laughs> and I'll come back in a second to why that's important. Um, but I'll move on because I'm running out of time. Okay, third, and to go back to the beginning, first critique then is about the actualization of critical theory. It's about engaging with theory, with method, i.e. with style, with theoretical lineages, in order to get to different forms of critical engagement in the world. And in this sense, the one that I stress most in the paper, it's about reorienting how we consider how critical thinking finds allies in the world, allies with whom we can work to actualize critical theory and nurture a different future. 
Um, and as Deleuze and Gattari once wrote, we're writing for unconscious and consciousnesses that have had enough. We're looking for allies. We need allies. And we think these allies are already out there and that they've gone ahead without us. There are enough people in the world to actualize a different form of future. However, the problem for the critical theory in particular has always been locating these allies, and particularly allies that we seem to desire. Because critique has typically operated in oppositional terms through judgmental reason, it's always limited its possible pools of allies to some degree. It's resist resisted with certain groups against certain others rather than actively attempting to co-opt, specifically co-opt, as many possible others, friends or enemies, in ways that provide use for the critical project. And here we can see how critical theory has become timid. It's become unwilling to take risks, particularly in the field of praxis. We prefer to stick with comfortable allies to our projects. But again, to turn back to Marx and Engels, it was them who declared very specifically in the Communist Manifesto that the Communists support every revolutionary movement against the existing social and political order of things, including elements of the bourgeoisie. The Communist Manifesto supported the bourgeoisie. It suggested specifically allying with them where they could be co-opted into a particular project for purpose and ends. This is classical Marxism. You do not only find allies with those you agree with, you tend to co-opt as many different people as possible. And in the paper, I lay out certain different ways in which this can be achieved and is being achieved at the moment. One is through a form of uh, what I've termed participant subversion, in which critical academics must deliberately uh, infiltrate, if we want to use this very war-fighting terminology, particular social fields with a critical end, accumulate capital within those fields, and then subvert them from within. This is not becoming policy relevant at all. And other people can talk about this in different ways. It's about subversion from within. Others involve engaging much more strongly with uh, the SDS literature on materiality, and I'll talk a little bit about this tomorrow, involves doing things concretely. It involves moving beyond the ideation, moving beyond the idea that if we speak truth to power, anything will happen, if we resist, etc. Ultimately, then, the idea is that post-critical uh, engagements with world politics are about revolutionizing the potentials latent in the present very actively and mobilizing them towards a different future. They're about recognizing with William Connolly the critique must seek a subversion from below that embraces the fact that the goal of systemic transformation at the heart of much social political critique today needs to be chastened by more interim possibilities of contestation that can pry open these seams uh, in what seemed to be a more robust structure of power. In this, then, the goal is very much to return to the audacity of earlier, indeed, Marxist, feminist, post-colonial interventions, interventions that took huge theoretical, methodological, and practical risks. It's about returning to this form of uh, audacious critical theorizing. It's about reversing critique from its current uh, slow decline, perhaps, into a, a normal science in which we are critical. We're now normal, but we're a normal science now. There are set methods, there are set ways of doing things. It's about attempting to revitalize critique to some degree. Um, and this is just one attempt to create a form of propagation against the current impasse within critique, and I hope there will be many others. Ultimately, I suppose, and again you'll see this is not particularly fixed what it is what's defined as, ultimately the goal of producing this label is ultimately about the fact that we're in a historical moment at which critique is needed. It's a time in which forms of critique must exercise their influence. Uh, it's one of those periods in history in which the crisis we see show the relevance of critical theory if it can be actualized. Um, but they seem unable to do this until they begin to again take risks, again be audacious, again embrace change, and again actively put into practice their subversive thinking. And to conclude then with Isabel Stengers, all through the last century and to this new one, critique has been a learning process, and this learning process, for better or worse, is producing its effect. And we should take it seriously, not just read the news and wonder if they will achieve something. Time is essentially running against us, and this is the focus, essentially, of the project. So that's basically what I wrote in the introduction. And now I'm going to pass all responsibility over to the panelists, starting with Zhao. Yes. To... Yes. So, Zhao. Yeah. Me first. Five, ten minutes. Yes, Anna specifically said that we have to go in reverse order. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Probably the critique of soccer. Yes. Okay, thanks, uh, Jonathan. Thanks for being here. Ten minutes, right? Okay. Uh, so just a few comments on what I understand about uh, post-critique. Um, 
and uh, my concerns about uh, certain takes on force critique and what we, uh, my colleague and I who are writing a paper about this, think would be uh, an interesting way of approaching it. So first of all, I think uh, what, what I've been hearing since we the meeting about uh, post critique, I think there's clearly a concern with uh, constructive critique as opposed to critique uh, that only deconstructs. So clearly there is a concern with the, uh, let's see, the limits of uh, post structuralist critique, be it in addressing uh, the crisis of uh, world politics, or actuality as it is, and also in offering some kind of alternative or some kind of uh, political project or some kind of uh, utopian perspective or horizon. I think that has to do a little bit with uh, what Jonathan was speaking about, the, the view of the future. Literally, post-structuralism is a way of problematizing uh, the way modernity frames temporality. Uh, of course, it's a critique of the whole representation of the present, uh, but clearly it's also a critique of utopianism and all forms of emancipation because uh, it's based on a certain uh, foundational uh, foundation to reason that uh, was vastly criticized by the you know, and all this. So the, the first concern I see was construction, establishment of alternative orders, uh, finding perhaps uh, not origins, but perhaps new foundations for thinking critically. Um, and that's that's the point where we find <coughs> some kind of homological thinking, practice theory, and so forth, uh, that characterize a lot of post-critique uh, uh, statements. And here I see also a concern with engagement, um, a certain uh, Activism, if you want, uh, which is very much linked to uh, the practical uh, orientation of the community. <coughs> the second concern I see is uh, a, a resist, to resist also a logic that gives up hope for change. And here there's a more strong normative element to uh, many post-critique manifestations. And uh, again, an indictment of all those that give up on uh, emancipatory logic or projects and that denounce post-critical theories especially as unable to offer emancipatory uh, uh, projects and hence uh, is, uh, has a deficit of critique concerning also actuality. And here the risk is not really going back to foundations but perhaps a certain historicism, or at least framing temporality as some kind of uh, historical uh, grounding for an emancipatory reason. And here you see Marxian uh, approaches that try to recover a certain historicism that allow thinking for the future based on the contradictions of uh, the actual. Uh, and here also, well, a critical stance would still have perhaps difficulty with, uh, with where do you speak from really, when you denounce uh, the real and when you announce uh, hope for change, if change is, has a direction. So here, I speak of historicism because I think there's a certain, uh, a certain uh, direction for, these, for this thinking that points to not a teleology, but at least to a horizon, the utopian horizon, that's not really compatible sometimes with, with the forms of critique we're used to do in IR and, and IPS. And the third, the third point or third concern with post critique that I, I would like to, to raise is that it's strongly geared towards actuality again, uh, with intervention, with certain uh, articulation of policy or political alternatives uh, that are inserted within uh, contemporary discursive regimes or within certain structures of political structures and social structures of, of power or in 
many other or governments. And here sometimes, and this happens also in critical IR, we find uh, an option for, for the imminence, for the imminence, which is uh, very clear in, in the phenomenology, but there's a return to that, and also many uh, strands of practical theory. And again, perhaps here again, you know, the Kantian hope that in imminence you will find a way to uh, transcend the real. Uh, so you, you find re instantiations of, uh, of uh, the problem of finitude, if you want. And see, here you see a lot of descriptive stuff, as if description would in entail some kind of critique of the real. So that's also one of the risks of engaging with what I call naive empiricism, which is uh, you know, often the result of the kind of uh, critique uh, of, uh, of, of well, uh, Marxism post So uh, these are these are three points uh, I would like to raise. I think, as Jonathan said, I think a lot of what post critique says can be found in other moments uh, of uh, reflection about critique. In 2005, uh, Richard Beardsworth wrote an article about the future of critical philosophy. And he had, you know, three points which characterized what is critique. The first was reflecting thinking about actuality, so the human. The second one was concerned with society as a whole. And the third, engagement. So betterment of society, ethics, normative. And in world politics, a politics defined by challenges to shape the world as world. And the necessity of world governance, some kind of integration, a move towards the goal. So here, when I'm trying to think about those critique within uh, the debates of IR or, or IPS, if you want, uh, we see this, this attempt to challenge uh, perhaps three, three important points that uh, characterize the limits, if you want, of critique in IR. So and I think the first point uh, is the critique, the limitations of the critique of limits. Uh, so the, the, the problems with all the reflection about how boundaries condition, establish conditions of possibility of thinking about time and also about the, the place of politics and how the efforts to think and investigate what is in between forms of mediation not always have led to, uh, let's say, the opening of possibilities of thinking of future as undetermined. Often, even this post-structuralist critique of IR that focuses on boundaries and limits, often, sometimes, or at least often, reifies uh, these very boundaries that it's trying to criticize. So we, we see you know, the problematization of the state frequently being unable to, to free itself from the problematic of sovereignty. So the, and the second instance of the limits of, of this critique in IR is a move towards the global, which we see very often in uh, also post-critical approaches. So the, the move towards the global is common, and people who do uh, well, many analytics of uh, current problems such as climate change, governmentality, uh, global governance, humanitarian action, development, and so forth. And the engagement, the actual engagement with these problems often leads to a preference for the global as a space of emancipation, or at least as a space of critique. And I find this, well, we find this a bit problematic, not just because the move from the international to the global is a complicated move, but also because the global suggests some form of uh, totality, and hence a horizon of utopia that can only be found in some form of totalization of the world as world. And finally, the second point, the third point, sorry, of this critique is uh, the turn towards the micro and the local, which we find certainly promising and, and more productive, but I think we think this has to be complemented in a way that resists the temptation of signifying, or at least give meaning to the local, through some rearticulation of transcendence or of the global. 
So here we're trying to resist you know, the, the whole movement to, of transcending, either through hope or through some new kind of emancipatory thinking. When we look at everyday life, everyday struggles, conflicts, and what, uh, what, what the whole turn to the uh, to the everyday life and the mind. And here, I think it's Jonathan put it very well. When the move towards an emphasis on heterogeneity and multiplicity, rather than these totalizing moves, is uh, fundamental for a, crit a, post critic a critique of critique, if you want. And especially also resisting uh, the kinds of critique, or at least an analytics of the micro and the local, uh, that subsumes its creativity, its potential for uh, uh, life and for creating the new, based on some reconciliation between the particular and the universal. So in this way, we think that creativity should be focused on the fragmentary one or the fragment as uh, the particle that has the potential to articulate new structures, if you want, or new uh, meanings. So that's that's uh, more or less. So we call it fracturing. Uh, Jeff Weissman and I. We'll talk about this a little bit more tomorrow. I think I'm, I'm out of time, right? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, so I thank you very much for the invitation talk about false critique. I'm still kind of trying to get my head around and I'm not quite sure exactly what I think about false critique. So I thought I would take a step back um, because I also want to think about the resources of my art. So the step back is about looking at the translations of false critique into my art. Right? So where is the false critique coming from and what kind of, what is the base have translated it? Based on that. Jonathan was, was talking about when they have translated it into my art what is happening, what kind of assumptions are coming with the translation of this debate. And then I want to look um, quickly, if I have time, at kind of, a, of an encounter uh, that I had earlier this summer to, to try to think um, what some of the issues around the might be. Uh, so there are two kind of two debates, I think, that have um, problematized post critique outside IR and both of which are taken into my art. So one is uh, the formulation of false critique in art history and literary studies. Um, and the second one is the formulation of the critique of critique or false critique um, in science and technology studies, new materialist, actor network theory, um, and Jonathan mentioned some of these authors. So the first objection um, <coughs> is, is primarily, I think, an objection to the method of critique. Um, and this is in terms of, you know, critique using the hermeneutics of suspicion, the opposition of surface and depth, um, and also the opposition of symptomatic reading. So this whole debate is very much placed, um, situated within reading texts, right? It's kind of literary studies and a kind of whole tradition of reading texts. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about one, what I found one, one text, which I think is interesting, as it raises some issues around this literary formulation of false critique. And this is a text um, by the feminist scholar Torel Moy in one recent um, edited book on, which is called Critique and False Critique by Elizabeth Anker and Rita Felsen. Right? So this is a kind of literary study. And the text is called Nothing is Hidden from Confusion to Clarity or Wittgenstein on Critique. I think she has a later. Um, version of this where it's Wittgenstein, Austin, and somebody else. Austin has Austin's of speech acts. Uh, <laughs> um, the second objection, <laughs> the second objection, um, I might change, next, next variation, right? And Austin. <laughs> um, <laughs> Austin. <laughs> Matters of facts or kind of uh, two matters of concern. 
right? So it's kind of an engagement with some of the impasses, the failures of critique, very much around questions of climate change and um, uh, some of the limitations of the scientific debate around climate change. This has been more recently um, reformulated in science and technology studies, in feminist science and technology studies, as matters of care, right? The matters of care are starting to come back into our art. I mean, of course, care is by no means new to our art. There's a kind of long tradition of feminist IR uh, dealing with care, but it's coming through this, this kind of different, um, you know, lineage, if you want, which is love to matters of concern, matters of care. Um, and this shift, I think, can be also understood within this opposition of critique as negation versus critique as affirmation, right? And we've heard this debate about critique as deconstructing versus critique as deconstructing. But what we have here is also a shift, particularly through methods of care, towards theories of affect, right? So there's kind of a shift towards critique and the production of new modes of affect or kind of attending to the emergence of affect and the move from um, you know, negative affects to kind of uh, hope, solidarity, um, and so on. Now, let me start first in this in this tribute. Let me start first with Thorin Moish's chapter uh, that I mentioned, Nothing is Hidden. Uh, where she summarizes what she sees as the critique of tax, right? And where she she's echoing this criticism of uh, the hermeneutics of suspicions, but suspicion, but also symptomatic really. And I quote from her, to engage in critique is to expose ideology and the workings of power, encourage resistance, and generally contribute to social and political <coughs> change. Practitioners of critique must therefore be fundamentally suspicious of anything that presents itself as an established fact, including the so-called facts of the text. The conclusion imposes itself, she argues, radical, committed, political, left-wing critic must be against the grain. Um, and of course, she groups a whole um, range of theories, as it happens, only male theories, uh, in this category, Marx, Foucault, Frederick Jameson. So against this, you know, hermeneutics of suspicious, suspicion, or what she calls the kind of surface depth, surface versus depth, um, reading, um, she proposes to develop critique and critical reading without invoking terms like hermeneutics of suspicion, or symptomatic reading. So interestingly, particularly when she turns towards, towards Austin, she turns to this particular idea of performativity, right, um, which of course resonates a lot um, with IR to try to avoid the opposition of surface <coughs> uh, late and manifest hidden show. Uh, and this is why she draws also here in Wittgenstein to propose as a motto of this post-critical approach or critical reading that is not beholden to the surface depth dichotomy or to what this dichotomy is, the idea that nothing is hidden. Um, nothing is hidden is in, was interesting for me in terms of how this debate comes into IR, right, in terms of reading text, because nothing is hidden. You know, it's exactly how Foucault formulated his method. Although Foucault appears on the wrong side in Torrance Moyes' chapter. Well, we have that in the, in the history of sexuality, where kind of ideas of repression um, are challenging in order to understand um, exactly how sexuality is you know, talked about um, a lot. We have it inversely in his analysis of disciplinary power, the visibilities of disciplinary power. Um, and now, at the, at the risk of something immodest, uh, about 10 years ago, I used the methodology of, um, of this, what I call at the time, the methodology of the surface, and I'll give you a quote from that time. Um, uh, when I argued, I called the focus on the ordering that security does, and the effects of this ordering has led me to employ a methodology of the surface. This was taken from Paul May, in fact. Effects are apparent on the surface, they are not hermeneutically hidden, nor are they simply an offshoot of structural causes. When asked to explain Foucault's method, Gilles Deleuze used the metaphor from Paul Valéry, the plus profond c'est la peau, the most profound is the skin. This dermatological metaphor does not oppose surface and depth, but indicates that everything is on the surface at the level of appearances. Interestingly, more than those to kind of have an example as, as this different type of critique, right, where that's not something hidden and you don't have this suspicion and so on, in, um, 
in Sherlock Holmes and Freud, uh, and she uses the reading that Carlo Ginsburg offers of conjectural reading where you read the traces. Now, interesting, I kind of see how reading of the traces is not symptomatic, right? That kind of no reading of the traces that doesn't link back, while one of the targets is just a symptomatic reading. Um, so I think one, what I, you know, I think it's important to actually place these debates both in the context in which you know they emerge in relation to the reading of text, but also in terms of how um, IR has been working with some of these concepts of performativity, you know, different modes of um, reading and so on. The second, and then I realize I'm running out of time, um, is this shift from um, from negation to affirmation, and particularly kind of an attempt to resist the violence, what is perceived to be the violence of critique by affirmative practices of hope, cherishing, admiring. So that's a kind of an attempt also in more to think about literary criticism as not being deconstructive, but admiring the text and cherishing the text. Um, and I want to suggest that you know, this is also, it is a problematic move, particularly as we um, move to an endorsement of these positive affects, right, um, for example, as care. Because I think that IR has shown us for a long time that, that care is problematic, and care is also practice of governing, right, that kind of different ways in which one engages with care, uh, but, you know, care to death, or, uh, you know, for this really antique it talking about casualties of care, right? So these are important elements that I think I are least tempering into this debate um, rather than translating directly and, and adopting some of these assumptions that go into it. And I'll have, if I have three minutes, I have three minutes, two minutes. Um, I want to turn back to a site um, in Greece this summer uh, to try to say something about this there's different types of critique. And I'm happy that Martina Pazzioli is here. Martina uh, and I went to Greece to try to talk to some of the uh, border management um, actors this summer. And we kind of almost stumbled upon <coughs> um, an occupation of one of the UNHCR offices in Athens um, by refugees who had not been given um, debit cards or like cash cards on which UNHCR is put money every month um, for the refugees, and, and they occupy the offices and um, basically claim their rights to the, to the cash card in different ways. I want to turn back to how the UNHCR reported on this occupation, right, that concerned them actually for, if I know, for longer than a, um, than a month. Um, and here's a quote from the UNHCR statement. Throughout the process, they say the UNHCR and the Catholic uh, Relief Services um, was working with UNHCR on the cash cards, have tried to engage with the protesters and resolve the situation through dialogue and provision of information about the cash assistance program, uh, including eligibility, they say. UNHCR understands and acknowledges the concerns raised, but condemns the use of threats, violence, and intimidation. Um, so, to me, it's really interesting, and that's what I'm trying to get my head around, that the UNHCR, of course, is formulating this occupation as a matter of concern. And we see the more you read, you see that it's also a, a matter of care, right? But at the same time, violence is erased from this um, form of, you know, kind of engagement with matters of, um, of concern, while being kind of um, reiterated as a potential of the occupation itself. So the is uh, threatening um, both to the staff, UNHCR staff who need to be protected, but also it's threatening to other people who now cannot get their cash cards, right? So they set up, we might have real kind of security issues here because people who uh, want to get their money cannot get their money because we have these people occupying our offices, therefore we can't give them, the other people can't give them the cards. It's quite complex. Um, quite complex process. So it seems to me that a lot of these moves that we see with post-critique just don't work here, right? Um, and on the side of, I mean, we can't just claim matters of concern or matters of care because that's exactly, right, the terms in which UNHCR is formulating its own terms of critique. But I also want to say that I don't think that, for example, criticism of neoliberal governmentality also work here. I don't think that kind of saying this is neoliberal governmentality, UNHCR is kind of you know, responsibilizing refugees and giving them money, because UNHCR is not giving everybody money. Mm -hmm. um, but also people claimed, I would need to integrate these critiques of the people who are there themselves. And there's a whole range of critiques, and I think this is what we need to take seriously. So 
um, you know, from questions of rights, where people are saying we have the right to this, uh, we have the right to the cash card, uh, <coughs> to questions of suffering, actually, where people will formulate critiques in terms of who suffer, we are, um, you know, we have an illness or a vulnerability, therefore we should be given money. Two conspiracy theories, right? Uh, so there's a whole range of critiques. So it's interesting to be based on this. I think we need to take them seriously. And if we think about critique, rather than, for me, rather than an impasse of critique, where I could see there is a proliferation of critique, right? And to me, it's a question of how do, you, how do we orient ourselves, right? If we enter this field as we are invited, how do we orient ourselves among these multitudes of critique? Right, and how do we think, how do we think with and which critique do we think and where do we place ourselves, but also what kind of resources can we bring to these different types of research, uh, different types of critiques. And it seems to me that there are resources in IR that we can uh, mobilize, so as I said, probably not the neoliberal government mentality one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thanks everyone for being in this hot room. Um, so, uh, I, uh, I was very uh, surprised and happy and also challenged by, by Jonathan when I was invited to contribute to the project because, um, you know, am I a critical theorist or am I even a post-critical theorist to the degree that post-critical seems a little less, on the one hand, a little more demanding than being a critical theory because you have to do more. Right? You both have to criticize and then you have to come up with answers or being constructive. Or, but then it also seems actually easier because um, also following on, on what you're saying, maybe post-critical, being post-critical um, just means you're pragmatic. Right? I'm just throwing this out. Um, but I, I took this very seriously um, and uh, said, okay, uh, I asked myself the question, could international practice theory which I have been engaged in, um, could that be considered critical theory or post-critical theory? And if you first look at how it presents itself in, in some of the more like quoted uh, pieces, uh, the answer is definitely no way. You know, it even I would go as far as to say the yeah, Emmanuel Adler and the new versions at least present themselves deliberately as not critical. You know, they they, they would say it's an analytical tool. Uh, you know, you can use it wherever we want, but it, we don't have a normative agenda. And we don't even have a critical agenda. We just, we just want to understand the world. Um, so it definitely doesn't look like critical theory. But then actually, I want to argue here, at least try to argue, that it has a, a post-critical possibility. And it, it might be a, a very interesting one. Um, and to do that, we just, um, Jonathan has really laid out what he means with post-critical, um, and we've heard there are versions, there might be different versions of this, but the way I understand it is basically that we've, we've reached a situation where something must be added to the critique, which is um, somehow uh, constructed and, and empirically engaged. So um, there the, the problem begins, because if we take practice theory, which is basically engaged with saying everyday interactions and, um, and moves uh, matter and have consequences for world politics. That is the main statement. If we take that, uh, then um, there are basically uh, two, I think, important critiques of practice theory that is re relevant for this discussion today. So the first one is on ontological. It basically says, well, in being so focused on these everyday moves, these trivial micro-sociological moves that let's say diplomats um, do when they negotiate in a room, um, you lose sight of the structure and you stay on the surface. That, that's very often um, and increasingly so leveled. Um, Josephine Kirky recently argued that practice theory's flat ontology leads to misunderstandings of courses and processes which do not exist at observable levels of reality. So this is a critical realist critique, but it could actually go for a lot of different theories, we would say, this is problematic, this focus, this is insistence on observing people who do things and, and this empirical <coughs> insistence. And I think that is at least overlooking the kind of practice theory I would like to do. Because if there's one thing that, that a lot of the more, you could also call international political sociology, insists on, it is exactly that there is embodied, silenced, um, 
hidden, <laughs> to go back to the question of service, ways of doing world policies that we've overlooked or taken for granted. And it is exactly the purpose of the theory by looking at mundane or the, the, the things that appear unimportant or low politics, the low politics, high politics, that we can understand power dynamics better. So I think that is a, a fundamental misunderstanding that because you focus on the micro or you begin with the micro sociological and you're not interested in, um, in exactly going beyond a represent, representational view of, of the world. Okay? Um, the second, um, and I think more um, useful and important critique comes from feminists, which is saying, well, this focus on competence, which was very important, at least in the edited volume, I think it's now we're a little bit beyond, but there's still this insistence or a focus on this idea that we're looking at competent behavior and some behaviors can be done more or less competently, and that is kind of the focus. And the feminist critique is saying, well, that's maybe not the most important. The most important is incompetence or failure and all the things that don't even get to be seen. So that's another ontological uh, critique, which is basically practice theory and insisting on looking at who makes it, who's performing, uh, and who gets an audience in these performances uh, simply overlooks marginal positions. I think that's a real, real critique. I think it can be overcome, I think it can be addressed, but I think it's an important. Um, and one move basically is then, and that's the second part, is to say, well, maybe it's because practice theory, at least in its US versions, has presented itself too narrowly in order to engage with the mainstream, which often happens. Um, and in that move, which is not innocent, it has actually left some of the most interesting and post-critical um, practice theory behind which is the one that is not interested in how practices order the world, that is not just in how practices confirm the rituals that confirm a certain state or the rituals um, that show up power among elites, but also the dis disordering, the disordering uh, view has been kind of forgotten. That's at least my, my argument in the paper, that, um, that there is also a whole range of what we could call practice uh, theories, Maurice Blanchot, a uh, notion of order, Lefebvre, others that have been looking at how marginalized, lower class people in, in subordinate positions have, or even um, Scott's uh, weapons of the week. I think it also belongs in that category. And in that move, there's something very interesting for the post-critical agenda. Because if, if social order is a collective achievement to which we all contribute, um, this means there's always this potential of a collapse of society. And um, in doing, in, doing in, in trying to understand those everyday moves, not necessarily among elites anymore, that would be the, an important move, um, and by insisting that irrespective of what we will find, these people are important in and of themselves, um, and here I'm, I'm glad Jonathan pushed me on this, You're, we, we are also making a moment of play. We're saying these are worthy of our attention. Um, and by saying this, we're also saying there's something, there's a power struggle going on that needs to be, if not uncovered, then at least look at. So, okay, so much. That sounds like critical theory. So, so if it has to be posted, it probably also has to talk about how the world could be different then. Um, and here, I would say, if it's an analytical claim that the stories that people tell are important, um, then I guess the obvious next step is to say, let's give them a voice, those people that we're actually interviewing or observing. <coughs> and it would be a very small step for people as empirically engaged as most practice theory oriented scholars are to just uh, shift the focus. You're always almost already there in the field. Um, so so letting the those you observe talk back to the field would be an obvious way to, to do that. Um, now this does not and I think this is where um, 
where people have will be divided is whether or not this is a real normative agenda or just an inclination. Is this just a, an opening or should it actually be a real <laughs> critical theory develop itself into something that has a clear normative agenda that will unite scholars? I think probably not. I think that, that's here I'm, I think I'm, I'm with you. I think the post-critical by necessity will cannot be a united uh, position uh, because that's part of the whole endeavor. Um, but I do think that there is a very deep normative commitment um, to the non-academic world in practice theory. And, uh, and there, I think that's probably where the potential um, of the practice turn is most important. Uh, so I wanted to be last so I could be really short, and everyone must be dying in the spring. <laughs> so warm. Um, I'm just going to make uh, four very quick points, and a lot of things have already been said. I'm going to—I didn't want to make the first point, but I'm going to make it anyway because actually, before coming in here, I met someone saying, "Well, where does all this come from? Where does this discussion come?" From? I just want to situate it in a very banal way, although it's already been done excellently both by Jonathan and Sal. Uh, and then I'm going to say that if you think about them. Uh, what it is. Um, for me, at least, uh, there's a, a real issue about what posts stand for, like even uh, not taking it in a banal way, uh, not taking it as just a general critique or something. Uh, and then I want to say something about perhaps it's a good thing if it's not really post, but just an excuse to read it. <laughs> and then I want to say something about, uh, okay, so what does that amount to in terms of the agendas and the Unitarians? And I'm going to try to do this really quickly. A lot of people, and we, I'm sure a lot of people have uh, things to say about this, and a lot of people in this room have, of course, written very uh, knowledgeably about these issues, so it's actually interesting to me today. So first, uh, how, where do I see this as coming from? Uh, uh, part of it, uh, Talia was in on this, Jonathan was in on this, uh, it's uh, intellectual traditions, and, uh, you know, the terms, uh, you said literary aesthetics, also STS, um, which uh, have wanted to turn against the sense of sort of structuralist uh, or holistic forms of theorizing and uh, a focus on domination and wanted to have a more, um, uh, a stronger sense of agency uh, in various ways. And I think that's where uh, a lot of that was framed for idiosyncratic reasons, I think. Uh, as being post-critique, because critique was seen, and that's where the de judgment and all these things come in, uh, was seen as sort of inhibiting this. And this, this kind of argument comes in different versions, depending on the context, whether you're in Germany or France or the UK or the US or which disciplinary environment. But it sort of revolves around that. So it actually has a specific meaning. And the, the label isn't just empty. Like a lot of people self-define against uh, what they perceive as uh, critical theory. So there's an intelli intellectual lineage that's more than, you know, labels aren't empty. And that's the second thing. It's, it's also something that's come in as part of a, an empirical discussion. And I think, you know, this idea that we can somehow just discuss our intellectual lineages without the context in which they're inscribed, you know, the political debates we have, we're in a context of post-truth, etc. Uh, and so a lot of people have had the sense that critique really had gone too far. Right? And I hear this, this also, this kind of argument that uh, we need to move, uh, you know, all these critical theorists who uh, tear everything down through a little bit of knowledge, they bear a co-responsibility for, we've heard this also, uh, people have said this in different versions on the panel already, I just want to make it very clear. So even uh, people who sort of were the originators, so if you like, of the sort of <coughs> uh, critical terms. So people like Sheila Yasanov, she's now sort of back on, let's, let's again refound science, let's stop this critical thing, it's gone too far, we're undermining ourselves, we need um, more solid position. But that, that's where the post-critical also comes, a fear of what the critique is doing practically. Uh, and so a sort of sense that, oh, we need to backtrack from uh, what we've actually <coughs> achieved. And I think both of these things are actually really, really important right, in terms of understanding why it's become so big, why a lot of people, you know, yesterday at dinner I heard a, 
a very critical, uh, whatever, or post pre uh, scholar explaining very seriously that, you know, in a, in a situation like the present one and, you know, the world turning towards it is, nuclear weapons, US, etc. of course, you know, we could no longer, we have sort of uh, backtracked from our critical positions and, and be more, become more uh, concerned with the conventional questions of, uh, you know, how <coughs> Uh, so, so this really is important. That's the first one. Now, um, I, I see sort of both of these things, and I want to uh, uh, comment on <coughs> them. So I, that's where I see the sort of post-critical move <coughs> come in. Uh, now, uh, what's problematic for me in all this? There are lots of problematic things in this, but uh, I want to say something that I'm not so sure. Like, so labels do things, and one of the things that really concerns me about the Post uh, critical, and in the paper I'll present tomorrow, I'll make that argument in full. But I'm really concerned about what the labeling does because, you know, labelings aren't just for free, they're not just sort of floating around, they do things. And, uh, and this sort of wish to say post, although, you know, we might reiterate uh, eternally that it's not really, but um, not, uh, it actually does feed into this rhetoric of reactions, sort of blaming critical traditions for all kinds of things. Uh, and sort of feeding into this empirical discussions, we now need to read down science and so on. Uh, and since I'm going to develop that more that part tomorrow, I, I want to insist on the fact that I actually yeah, here I just want to say that I'm not so sure actually that um, uh, that this is what the post is really about. Like if you take the post, what all these post people are doing, I tell you about the method of the circuit that I said only at least ten years ago. I could do the same thing with Bourdieu, although, of course, he's the core target. Okay, you know, listen, uh, Bourdieu actually said, look at what's there. Uh, I mean, it's not about, you know, the, all the Latour kids saying it's all about him and so on. And then I also want to make the point that, you know, if we think a little bit about it, of course, you know, showing things in a different way, uh, that's uh, what critical theory is about. Uh, and actually turning around, so that I quite like, like, we've had a lot of definitions here, but Hornet, uh, Hornet's view on the traditions of uh, critical thinking. The title of the book is uh, Pathologies of Reason. So it's all about actually imminence and you know, continuing uh, moving around boundaries of knowledge uh, and thinking about you know, the pathologies of reason uh, and how they work. So I'm not so sure actually, in a certain sense, all the thinking we're having around posts and the need to move posts and so on, I see as very well feeding into a classical uh, critical tradition. You have more stuff, and I, yes, I mean, indeed. Uh, so I'm a bit, uh, I'm a bit concerned about you know what the post is, and uh, and because the, I see the post as uh, performative, actually, uh, in terms of in a conservative sense, uh, I I am a bit uh, concerned about that. Um, <coughs> now, perhaps. However, or something like that, perhaps it's really good, like perhaps we do need to say post. I mean, perhaps one can turn this into the positive or so on. Is what we really do need is more critique. And if this can trigger more, I think Jonathan said this quite clearly, actually, if, if this can trigger reflection on what critical thinking is and does at the present, uh, that's a very good thing, because precisely the retreat uh, from critique is what I think is absolutely not needed. Uh, I think a very banal way of framing a lot of... Um, uh, both the post-colonial feminist, uh, but also any critical theory, of course, uh, any sort of return on that should um, alert us to the lack of attractiveness of nostalgia. Like, who would want to move backwards to the world where we did not have critical theory and could not think critically? I don't know. I don't. So uh, if, if the label post uh, can actually uh, push uh, and work as a taking critical theory forward, um, somehow miraculously getting rid of the uh, conservative implications that the labeling has, then I would be uh, very happy with this. I'm a little bit concerned uh, about the focus of much of the post on the, on the future and on the, uh, that you said ignore the present and even more ignore the past. Now, of course, amnesia uh, is rather problematic. I, you know, a lot of positions, 
imagining credible futures and imagining where we might head, I think requires actually also thinking about the past. I think you talked about care, Joan Tronto and care, one of her core points about, you know, uh, she works on the political theory uh, of theories of care. Uh, she makes again and again the points about the import of thinking about, uh, you know, where people come from. And I would be very hesitant actually to think about engagement as that doesn't engage with the present and the past, because I don't think we can. I don't think we're well served in terms of trying to imagine futures without that kind of engagement. No. Um, uh, but um, so the point. So I'm. I think it's very important to rethink. I think it's important maybe to also recognize the critical traditions in this, uh, and uh, perhaps we can keep both. Perhaps not. I'm not so sure, but. Uh, anyway, uh, and certainly not to move into this sort of pure you had utopianism realm. Uh, yeah, uh, utopianism I think is very close to imagination, uh, stingers, etc. Of course, we need this, but we need it also in an anchored fashion. So there is an anthropologist, I'm thinking with the anthropology side of it, uh, Gaston Hage, who, uh, who builds up um, an argument about the uh, ways of focusing on. Um, uh, domination and ways to focusing on uh, political alternatives and the radical imagination and makes the point that they will always necessarily have to be linked in various ways. And I couldn't agree more. Um, okay, so one, two, that was my third point. The fourth point, um, I think the one thing that I undoubtedly uh, am some whole, fully positive about in the post-critical uh, move is the, uh, is the tending to uh, style and the openness to innovate in the form of critique, which I think uh, it's sort of come partly because of where it comes from, the, the intellectual traditions and so on, but the, the willingness to uh, pick up on uh, different ways of thinking. And now, all these points have been made, I'm just going to very briefly flag them, but so one of the things about the pathologies of reasons and so on is that, of course, reason becomes problematic in its own right. Uh, and so there's a lot of, uh, we've had effect as that somehow. But the, the turn to various kinds of critique that includes a focus on resonance, and if anyone knows Mark Grossa's uh, work on, uh, he's tried to recap critical theory in a German side, so pretty classical way of doing it, uh, in, um, uh, in resonance rather than reason. Uh, I think that's actually wonderful. And so, and we've had this, so I just need to sort of point here and say, okay, so we had the, we had the film and rhythm and, you know, the focus on those kinds of issues. We, we've had the focus on effects and metrics, et cetera, as ways of doing for the uh, And we've had of the, the um, uh, forms of sense making uh, that uh, work differently than through uh, reason and argument and language and text. Uh, if one might say. Um, so uh, I think this is really good uh, and really to be embraced and sort of pushed forward. And my only concern is I'm not entirely sure. Uh, first of all, I don't see really why this is post in any way, like in what way is it post, except, you know, we take further, but that's inherent in any critical theory. So really, uh, I mean, we take further, yes, but why post? Um, and, uh, and, and particularly, and maybe this is really an issue for discussion, particularly considering what the post label is doing, right? what it's doing uh, in terms of saying, uh, sort of feeding into discourse about um, the uh, negative nature of words. Okay, excellent. Thank you, everybody. Um, <laughs> So we're running a bit late, but let's open the floor to questions. Thank you for the panel and the call and inspiration to think about critique. What's critique, I think, was a question you also spoke about, and of course, what's post critique. And I just want to pick up actually on one very specific thing that Jonathan said in your discussion concerning the crisis. How we react to that, or how we not react to it. Because he made this, this point basically, because he said uh, that thinking post critically means to ignore the crisis, and then of course specify not, not to ignore it, not to see it not as a disease, but as a symptom of something else. Mm -hmm. that with the 
that then a two questions like one a symptom of what? Then because I think this this way of thinking that also the Marxist critical tradition, there would be a lot of information on well this is a symptom of something deeper of the crisis of capitalism of course. But one thing what a symptom of what would it be? And the second thing is when you say that our reaction to the crisis should not be or, or maybe should yeah should not take the form of critique um for the worst rather look for new weapons. Um, I'm just wondering because it's my own interest or my own my own rather my own direction that I take when I react when I react basically to the I rather look for old weapons, the dust of old old weapons because because it is so striking when you read for instance um, old critical theorists, Leo Löwenhardt's work on prophets of deceit, we are so struck by uh, how, how they analyze agitation and how similar it is to the language used by Donald Trump, for instance. And I find this looking into the, these old texts extremely helpful to understand what is what is like it is wrong in this populist discourse. And so, so the second, the second question is basically like is that is that the direction I take when I when I think about crisis is this is this then because I have then the feeling this is not post critique if I do that. Uh, like this this is the counter project basically. I dust of old weapons instead of finding new ones. Is, am I correct here? Is that is that like is that something we then have to argue about um, uh, when we like that would be a counter position then. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Benjamin Thales from the Institute of International Relations here in Prague. Um, I, I've been involved in this project for some time and um, I, I thank the panel for actually one of the most fruitful discussions I think we've had so far about what, what this is, what it does, uh, and where we disagree on some aspects of this, where we have different ways of, of approaching. One point on what the label does, we'll look at the room, the room is packed, people have kept attention, um, it is clearly drawn attention. This, this label had, if we had a panel called What's Critical IR, I don't think it would have the same, same effect. So it has had a, some kind of galvanizing effect, which seems to have caught some kind of a moment. More particularly, and I think this is to speaking to what Anna was saying as well as some of the other participants, post-critical, when I first heard the label, I thought, fantastic. I finally found a label for what it is I do, um, having never quite understood this before, but I thought this, this speaks to me intuitively about what it is. I think it allows some of us, and I would include myself in that group, to become perhaps somewhat alienated from some aspects of critical IR. We found ourselves unable to agree with some parts of the North Drive, some parts of the extremism we find in it, uh, the sweeping judgments, and so on and so forth. This is not everyone, but some. Uh, to find a way back in to the parts we found inspiring about critical IR uh, in the first place, or that actually could we thought could be leveraged differently and put to work in the world differently, to make critical change in the world, as Jonathan put it in an earlier um, iteration of this, this paper. So I think it's an extremely helpful label. I take the point that it could potentially be conservative, but I think also it has progressive potential as well. I think it's in the doing of it that we will see that, which relates to the different normative drives that some of us bring to the project and how we actually go about making it happen in the world, who we engage with to do so. What that also implies is, uh, I mean, I like, love the point that it was not logical but ecological, and I think the idea of of an ecology of post-critical IR, of different people doing different, different things within it, we don't all have to do it one way, not everyone would have to do it through a particular kind of engagement or a particular kind of theorizing, but if it's to have some kind of coherent and familial relation, then there are some things that perhaps need to be agreed upon and others, others less so. But I think we'll find out about that in the doing. And the different roles that people take on is something perhaps we're going to talk about more through the, the section. Um, and that's not to provide labor for people, but from people, saying actually how do we find ourselves in this and how do we find what it's going to be useful for, for us. Just very quickly on the point about the future. I also agree this is about the future. It's about finding the future again. Uh, I think this is something that Franco Berardi said some time ago about the slow cancellation of the future and the inability to imagine the future, the, 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 the deconstructive project. Um, but also pop culture and movements focus so much on nostalgia, on the retro, and on actually the, the loss more widely in popular cultural society of a future that was better than the past, the future that our children would have that was better than ours. That has disappeared from a lot of popular thinking, political thinking, as well as academic thinking. 
And I think recovering and reimagining futures without necessarily colonizing them is a, is a very good underlying thrust of this project and one that's highly necessary. But nonetheless, disentangling the future from the present and the past is a notorious exercise, so I wish us luck. <laughs> I was wondering if you can explain more your point about moving beyond resistance, because it's not totally clear to me in which sense you want to reconcile. But like people said, first critique is not about after critique, but critique can for me to supplement critique with something else. But if critique is further rapid, as you argue, I don't understand. For me, resistance is not about the past. For me, resistance is about this, this subject, this objection, okay? This subject, uh, Finding a way to uh, for, to, for the people to um, escape the situation of subjection. So if you don't link critique and resistance conceived in this way about this objection, how can you start? I, I agree about thinking about the future, but it starts if if critique becomes a catalyst for struggle or for uh, or, or for a, like a starting point for thinking about the future. I don't understand why beyond resistance. I don't see resistance in this very like physical terms just as a reaction. Uh, and if you can also clarify, but maybe I, uh, I didn't get your points. And very, you said we need to uh, reconceptualize the, the nexus between critique or post critique and with the crisis. I don't know, it comes to my mind that it by Jenny and Joyce about this anti-crisis, so the, the, the need of the linking critique and crisis because it's a dangerous articulation. So in order not to corroborate this uh, narrative around the crisis, so what does it mean to intervene uh, in the present, for me, and not in the future, uh, without uh, replicating this crisis narrative? Thank you. Um, were you first? I think so. Um, Matthew Fluff from the University of Westminster. Um, thanks for a really interesting uh, um, it's kind of an introduction to post critical IR. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. The first is um, Is there a danger of conflating lots of different critical traditions? Um, so I'm a bit concerned that Valuable as the project is, that as you're pursuing it, there's a danger that you're bundling together something that's called critical IR. And actually, I think discipline's always had a bit of a problem with labels, partly because it ends up using labels like critical IR, where you bundle together a whole diverse range of things together, and then just move on. You can sign up, or you don't, and that's that. Um, and there's a couple of kind of sub dangers here, maybe. Uh, one of which is that past debates get neglected, or past theoretical groups get neglected. I think one of these is quite interesting, which is the birth of Frankfurt School of Critical Theorizing in IR is accompanied by the way that half of the school is completely useless and therefore we should evolve them. Okay, because they're pessimistic, they don't have any practical recommendations to make, so let's talk about half. Which I think was really deeply, deeply damaging the critical IR. And the second one is that also this kind of bundling together of critical thought like under the, you know, the current critical context is actually quite a very difficult thing to do. But it, it's potentially, I'm not saying it's what you're doing, it's potentially quite a reaction thing to do to bundle together as if they share some kind of problem. Um, so that worries me a little bit. Um, second question um, how would you characterise the threats? That are inspiring this movement, which is like our uh, greater engagement, so it's kind of less negative. So, how would you characterize those? Um, it seems to me that not all of the threats we face at the moment are about being more active or more proactive. Okay, so, part of the threat to our universities at the moment might take, sometimes take, to my view, the form of a demand that we are practicing. You are useful, and if you're not, then you're in trouble. I wouldn't want to leave studying medical manuscripts, which is an example. You the moment, okay? If you can't show you're useful, you're in trouble in the university, certainly in the UK. Mm. Um, so there's a threat from this demand of being abstract. And likewise, there's a danger of attacking abstract. <laughs> okay. I think we need to think very carefully about 
how abstract thought might be useful and it might be useful to this kind of project as well, actually. And the danger of setting up an opposition between the two things, which needn't be there, um, and which could actually be really useful as you think. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm still trying to sort of process, but um, maybe about the concern um, of the post was critical. We spent a fair amount of time this morning talking about whether it was a critical theory of the cultural possibly a firm type of relativist or not. Um, I'm not sure. Um, but either way, I think there is a very important element to the post it was critical that is worth keeping. I think I, I, I often wonder, I don't go to conferences very often, but when I do go to conferences, I wonder how my family, my friends, arriving randomly in settings like me to wonder about what on earth possesses me and everyone here. Um, not because we're, we're mad, uh, but because we certainly have been, I think, accused of, and rightly so, of being extremely navel-gazing uh, as moving away from uh, theory practice. Uh, unity, that old Marxist thing, um, away from affirmation, away from, from Gramscian sort of terms of just being organic intellectual in which they perform, um, the old joke of critical theory just being Marxism without the proletariat. Um, I, I wonder if you would comment on, on that. Okay. Um, we have two last questions very quickly. Uh, uh, yeah. And that is happening. It does not come from us going off in 
abstract directions and uh, some bad people out there are using Deleuze um, <coughs> against Deleuze's wishes or something like that. No. What's happening is that because we are practice and because we have actually influenced this society as it is, these thoughts are now a part of it, and they're now a part of the political practice of this society. We don't own them. We have no control over how they're being used. So it seems to me that you know, if we just recall a little bit looking into the past, these arguments, the point is not to go out and look for the future or the practices or mm -hmm. try and establish agency. The point is to go back and do exactly what political theory was supposed to do then we reflect on how we have come to play a role in setting up the society as it is at the moment, not because we're fascists, but because we, we cannot help but being part of those practices. And so you know, my argument would be completely against post, post fatigue. It would be for actually remembering what fatigue is. Well. <laughs> um, should I comment on that? <laughs> uh, yeah, let's do another round quickly. We're running by time, behind time, so if we can keep it like uh, one, two minutes, Joe. Why don't you start? I'll start. <laughs> I agree with everything that's been said. Um, the, the only thing I would disagree about what you just said in particular is that that's if we take a very specific intellectual history of the term critical theory which is not what I'm specifically talking about. And I would disagree how that, I would agree with everything you just said about mm -hmm. theory being practiced, about critique being practiced, 100%. What I disagree with is that that's all we have to do or could do, which is completely different if you look back in the intellectual history of social movements, if you look in terms of people who were critical previously, if you look at the slow decline of the university as a, uh, as a kind of extremely engaged body, if you look back in these very technical ways, if you look at when the university, university professors were very involved in the development of, say, the printing press. It would involve using these tools. There are direct engagements between journalists, between critical academics, between other people. So this is a separate issue in terms of the knowledge economy of academia and how that's declined, particularly in Europe and America. And that issue is one it's declined in certain spheres to some degree, and there's different issues why that's happened. And whether or not we can recover that is a different question. And I still agree on the theory, practice, etc. thing. Um, but... Um, I'm not entirely sure that that's where we need to stop, and I don't think we need to look to die to the past and define critical theory at the Frankfurt School because I mean, Adorno is immensely depressing, depressing about it. And I'm not. I don't. I don't want to. And, um, okay, I'll go through a few others. Boltanski and social symmetry. Yes, a lot to do with this. I have a paper tomorrow with Rocco Bellanova and Michael Kaufman where I actually argue we don't need post critique also. So I'm being self-contradictory. But yeah, Boltanski is a big thing. Um, Dangerous conflating lots of the danger of losing abstract thought. Uh, was, yeah, something about the danger of losing abstract thought. This I completely agree with. This is not about uh, focusing solely on practice and turning the university into a social movement in and of itself per se. It, abstract thought is vitally important to this, and lots of the things are extremely, I would say, abstract in how they deal with it, and extremely theoretically deep in how they do it. So this is not about that at all. Um, and I, but I agree that's a danger. Um, something Anna said about the uh, conservatism of the label. Uh, okay, yeah, I'll talk about what I said, which I probably didn't make very clear, about ignoring the present slash past. What I did mean is don't take lessons, study of the past, future, present. What I meant is this, this particular issue with resistance and the present and reactionary forms of critique are problematical. And here again I will quote Deleuze, where he says, repressive forces don't stop people expressing themselves, they force themselves to express themselves. This is essentially a modern form of power in which we want people to express themselves. Trump wants you to tweet him back. He wants you to retweet him and comment on him. They all want this to happen. This fixation with the particular present moment and its crisis distracts to some degree from the past about how, what's made it possible, about why it's only a symptom of a particular historical uh, evolution of human society. And in terms of what it's a symptom of, I think Anna touched on some of that in terms of a shift towards a resonance effect about different ways in which society is being governed and which we still have very few tools to deal with. We're still obsessed with epistemic, we're still obsessed with writing papers, we're still obsessed with PowerPoint, we're still obsessed with particularly epistemics as opposed to dealing with the shift in society which has moved very far away from this form of logical reasoning. Um, 
but that's an aside. Do you want to continue for one minute? 30 seconds? Yeah. <laughs> Just to ask a real question of conflating, I think that's a risk. Uh, when I think about post critique or whatever it is, I'm thinking about a lineage in IR, uh, which is really linked to post structural. Uh, and what am I, the threats, well, being co opted for sure, or normalized, certainly. And in the case of, uh, of uh, critical IR or post critical IR, it's, it's uh, captured by a certain empiricist thrust that uh, makes it lose critical view, critical thrust. Uh, and yeah, uh, I'm skeptical about the Marxian contribution to uh, critique, because I think as a theory of praxis, it did lose historically a lot of uh, analytic capacity and also capacity for understanding the real. So that's, uh, so I, I take the contribution of critical theory and pure theory of practice <coughs> as a agree that thinking is about always a, in the world and about the world. So theory is about intervening. Uh, but I see uh, the constructive tool as does the more privacy to, to think about life and creativity. That's uh, the main challenge. Um, very quickly, I tend to think of both continuity and discontinuity. So I would take up the point of kind of looking back at something right, that was uh, conflating them. But I would avoid kind of saying, let's take, you know, theory and practice and we just kind of look back at them and kind of reapply them. It seems to me that that doesn't take sufficiently into account some of the transformations that we have seen from like technological transformations. You know, and this is a debate that actually took place within critical theory itself, at least the kind of split that you need to understand, and I'll talk about some of that tomorrow. Um, so it seems to me that this is particularly important. It's also important to kind of, to me, not to think, again, collect theory and practice, and I quite like the way Bourdieu thinks about mm -hmm. different fields of knowledge, actually of scientific knowledge, and he looks at sociology, but we could think about IR and politics in similar terms, because his point about sociology is that Unlike um, mathematics, and it's interesting that we've got two medieval manuscripts and not mathematics, which is even more abstract, right? That we never make that argument about mathematics. Um, is that it's the one that has the most fluid boundary, the one that has least autonomy, because the object of sociology, right? Society is the one that everyone has a stake in. I mean, we think in similar ways about politics and international politics, right? And this kind of lack of autonomy and kind of an inability to fully claim autonomy creates particular moves across this, this boundaries, which I think are important, but it also kind of alerts us to the specificity, right, of internet relations that <coughs> politics. Um, and then I think not conflating all these different disciplines would be more critique. I don't know, but yeah, kind of. <laughs> I guess it's the engaging critique in some way, right? It's, it's, but yeah, we, we do have all been bored if it had been just the engaging critique, maybe you would have a better problem. <laughs> yeah, briefly, uh, great, great questions and comments. Um, just two things. One on um, on your question about how far does the the researcher, how far do we actually need a researcher to make theory? And I think that was a great question. I think that for me would be really where I would I would be drawn to that that way of thinking. And it relates totally to what you were saying about what if we invited our families into this room. Um, there's a sense in which um, a certain humility or humbleness towards the kind of constructs we are we are making theoretically um, that they somehow um, and, and here I think we're not in agreement. But I I, I, I was very happy with, with the critical the critical engagement of of this is that for me saying that we are the practice yes certainly and reflexivity about position which the kind of constructs we produce that also help shape the world for sure. But is that is that then if and if we look at our journals now, they do not do very much what you were saying. They do not use the fact that we are we're the minority, the rest of the world is actually the one doing world politics. And if we listen to them, they will tell us theoretical things we haven't even thought of, including 
ways of so, so making solutions to some of the problems. So while I agree with all what you're saying, I think it would be just a more interesting road for the IR to take to be more more humble about um, what we can contribute and maybe shift the balance a little bit. So I, I'm totally for that. How, however we do it, but the uh, this way for me is very promising. Yeah, I feel, I feel like uh, everything has been so I And I'm not going to say I agree with everything, but I, I was very happy about your comments, actually. And uh, it's, it's much of what I deal with in my paper on this. And I totally agree uh, with Beate about uh, you know, the importance of the tradition and uh, actually also not complaining for all kinds of reasons because they have different lineages. I think one of the things that comes up very clearly in the discussion, though, is that that's, that's absolutely not the risk we're running. <laughs> because yeah. if anything, uh, we're, we're actually feeding into uh, pretty um, uh, strong traditions. And, and I just want to make a comment about the symmetry uh, along those lines, because I think, you know, I, I think we have this comment about Horkheimer and the way he sees it. I, I actually think it's a classical move of critical theory to think symmetrically, uh, which is not to say that, you know, practice and theorizing uh, is the same. And it's actually quite important if you want to think about, you know, concepts and so on, to keep them apart and to be aware of the different styles of reasoning for packing um, uh, that are at work uh, with different critical traditions. Uh, and I think that's really, just to, to round this up, so I would really want to uh, to keep symmetry, but to be very clear on uh, the differences, actually. You know, maybe we're all doing practice in one way. Yes, of course, but it's a specific practice. And, your, you know, your mother or your friends or, uh, you know, the bus driver was my supervisor's favorite reference, uh, might not actually be interested in the kinds of discussions we're ha having, but they're very important, the little door of abstraction, uh, Whitehead and Stengers and so on really do matter, right? Uh, and this, just to finish off promoting uh, how I suppose to do I actually, I'm completely with Rebecca, having said this, the importance of symmetry and keeping this up, I really think that we need to engage with uh, the kinds of things that people do right? and to speak a language that they understand. And therefore, for that reason, I'm, I'm totally persuaded uh, of the importance of actually doing work. And it's not only, so it's a language they understand, like to translate, that move translation is very important. But it's also political move, because I think it's, uh, you know, we've been talking about the importance of not bundling uh, theories, but I think also uh, it, thinking in terms of, you know, the spatial uh, uh, time space uh, locations of the things we do, and looking at the, the fractures and whatever you said, disordering practices that are at work in different places is actually very important uh, for thinking about whatever, resistance or something like that. Mm -hmm. okay. So. okay, next. Uh, we have no time for questions. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much to everybody being here.